first of all, I just want to say thank you very much to President Pollard and, <laughs> and to um, everybody here at Montgomery College. It's already been a great experience. I've had a bunch of fantastic conversations. I love speaking to people like you. And what I mean by people like you are people who walk the walk. Uh, we often tell our students that you should be reflective, you should be thinking about what you're learning, you should be developing your metacognitive skills about what you're doing well and what you could perhaps improve on. Uh, and so educators that literally walk that walk and take time every now and then to think about what we're doing, what we're doing well, and how we can do it better. Um, well, you're my people, I guess, and so it's always great to be in a, in a room uh, like this. I am going to be um, talking today a lot about things like critical thinking and whatnot, but I want to start by just kind of framing things a little more generally. And that is to have this neuroscience kind of backing because I actually think we're at a very exciting time now where a lot of institutions have developed things like learning management systems, uh, but now they're asking, okay, how can we use technology to really enhance education? Uh, we're communicating better, we're connecting better, but we want to educate better. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is a time when we're all very reflective and what I think that means is as we look to technologies, there's sort of two ways we can use technology. We can find technologies that are out there and think, how could I use this in my classroom? And some people are doing some really creative, clever things that way. But I'm going to talk about a different approach. And I'm going to talk about an approach where we build the technologies to meet the challenges we want informed by brain sciences. So what we know about the brain, the actual structure of the brain and where things happen, but also what we know about the mind, the processes the brain uses to deal with information. If we understand them and how they map onto the educational experience and then use technology perhaps in a way to take this otherwise impossible learning experience and deliver it on the kind of scale you've heard about that I kind of live in. Uh, actually, 1,900 students is not my largest class. That is my smallest class. <laughs> the MOOCs tend to be much larger. Um, but this is the challenge. I love teaching to a large class, but I really want to give them a deep educational experience. So I have certain constraints in my world uh, that, that have affected how I do things, but it turns out I think that the process is one that can be applied generally, uh, as, as can the result uh, of all this. So let me kind of walk you through that a little bit. I want to bring up just one of the challenges. We face many challenges as educators, and here's one that I face in my large world, and I'm going to use this more as an example of an approach, uh, which is, when I ask my students, what's my job? What am I here to do? Uh, they typically very quickly come up with this one. You are here to impart information. So I teach introductory psychology, so you should tell me about the, the biggest findings in psychology, the important figures, the data that supports them, et cetera, et cetera. And absolutely, that is a core part of, of all of our jobs. Um, but I want to point out a few things that we know about information. First of all, of course, information is everywhere around us. Um, thanks to Wikipedia and all these other sources, information is at our fingertips literally at any point in time. Um, what we know from the cognitive sciences is that the kind of memory systems we use to learn new information, they, they go by names like episodic memory and semantic memory, they are actually very powerful processes that if the information is presented in an engaging, powerful way, these systems can learn it in one shot. So one great lecture on your part, one very well-written textbook, perhaps that animation you find online, that repurposing of education, a really good presentation of information can make somebody know it very quickly and relatively easily on our part. Uh, we still have to obviously craft that presentation and we work very hard um, to do that. But we at least kind of know how. And in fact, this is probably the thing that we all think of and that students cer certainly think of about our job. And I think we're doing this quite well um, already. I don't see this as the major challenge, although I still see, I know we're d at, at Montgomery College, there's a push for open resources and shared resources. And I think that all fits into this. There's a lot we can do to improve this. Um, but we're doing pretty well. What I think is the real challenge is this one. Um, sorry, information is cheap. I just mean that cheap, easy to, to present. But this is what I think is the real challenge. And this is the, the thing that students don't even typically think is part of our job. So I will tell them, if we do our job well, hopefully, 
in every course that you take, you will be challenged to use these skills. Okay, so I want to highlight communication, collaboration, critical thinking, creative thinking. These are four of the magical C's. Some people have six C's, some people have seven C's. There's a whole bunch of C's out there. Uh, but these four are, are just about part of every set of cognitive skills. And the important thing to realize is they are skills. I sometimes like to sum up a lot of what I say in the following sentence. You can learn a lot about karate in an hour. You cannot learn karate in an hour. Um, in fact, you cannot learn it in a day, a week, or a month. It's a very different brain area that underlies that skill learning, and it's a very different cognitive process uh, that's involved. It only develops through repeated, structured practice, and everybody sucks to begin with. <laughs> right? So if I want to look at your guitar playing skills or something, if you've never played guitar, you're going to not sound good. Um, and, and by the way, I'm just going to mention this because a lot of educators will sometimes point to things like, oh, well, you're trying to develop these skills, but, but, but our students aren't very good at those skills. And so I'm like, okay, <laughs> so that's why you want to develop them. You know, that, that, it, the, to the extent that it's not uh, something that's natural for them, we really want to get this natural because these are the skills of leadership. In fact, we, we were touring the Washington um, monuments and sites and we were at the, the Martin Luther King one yesterday and, and I noticed that he has a quote that um, uh, suggests that everybody should have certain basic things. One of those basic things is education. Education is empowerment. And if you think of Martin Luther King, could he think critically? Could he think creatively? Could he communicate well? I mean, that's probably the big thing we think of, but obviously there was a lot of critical thinking and creativity that went into what he put into words. Um, and he changed the world. So not every one of our students is going to change the world, obviously, to that extent, but these are the skills that will serve them well all through life. But repeated, structured, deliberate practice, how do we fit that into what we do? Um, that is my ch that's my challenge. This is the one that I've kind of chosen to take on. So I want to kind of give you a sense of, of how I gone about it. Because these ones are, I think we're not doing these that well, and they are expensive. And but what I mean by expensive, I almost, you know, I, I had valuable at one point, and I think maybe valuable, but it's both. I, the cheap and expensive, I'm kind of implying how much effort do we have to put into it. And this seems to take a lot of effort. But these skills are extremely valuable. So if we could find ways of, of teaching these well uh, without completely disrupting everything we do, that would be really powerful. Okay, what do we currently do? This is going to sound harsher than it is, and I don't really mean it to sound harsh. But I do think that often now, we kind of hope that if I give a good lecture, that'll spark thoughts in my students. So they'll think critically about it. And maybe they'll talk to each other after the lecture. So maybe they'll have some communication that's going on. Or maybe when they read that reading I asked them to read, they'll find that interesting and they'll critically analyze it and have an idea and share it. Well, maybe they will and maybe they won't. Uh, and it seems to me this is a, a, a too unstructured. I sometimes compare this with people learning a sport by playing with the other kids in the neighborhood. You're going to learn something. Your skills are going to develop but there's only so far they can go in that environment. We really need that much more like a minor league kind of environment where people are drilling these skills a lot more. And so that's really what we've been trying to do. One of the things we've been trying to do uh, in our lab is to do that. So now this is the process. And I think this process can be applied to a lot of things. We started by finding out what works. So before we do anything, I think one of the core things we have to do is stop thinking about constraints at the beginning. Don't say, okay, this, this is the world I live in. Forget about that. What is the world you wished you live in? What educational experience do you, would you like to give your students? And then once you start figuring out what those things look like, then you can start figuring out how to constrain that within our current reality. So we did this with my you know, 18, 1900 student class. We started saying, but we want them to think critically. We want them to think creatively, we want them communicating, we want them collaborating. What do we know from the research literature, from neuroscience or from cognitive science, that we know works in that regard? And let's forget about the context, just what works. 
And so here are four things that we found, and I'll show you how we brought them together. First of all, if you want students to think critically or creatively, you can't constrain the, the assignment too much. You've got to give them the room to think critically or creatively. So you need a very open-ended assignment where they can go where their mind takes them. Um, but you also want to obviously scaffold this. So what I mean by this is if you're asking them to be creative, if they don't really know what that means, like what, what is creative? Like how do I know if I've reached that goal? You should be giving them clear rubrics, uh, especially if the skill level is relatively low, a really clear idea of what it is you're looking for, and hopefully some exemplars and other kinds of things that can so-called scaffold it, give them a, a better sense of the goal they're trying to reach. Um, so that's step one. Now here's step two. This is the real thing that when I learned about it, kind of blew my mind, peer assessment. Blew my mind in the following way. We often will have students in, in one of your classes, which are one of my dream classes, I think 20 students, let's say, in a class. So you give, somebody, you give them an assignment to do some sort of activity, and you get 20 students producing output, producing a result. Often, those students never see the other 19. All they ever know is, you told me to do something, I did it, and eventually you told me I did it OK, and here are some things I could do better. But there's 19 other ones floating around. And there's a very strong literature that suggests if you use that. So especially if you use this in a more formal way. If you could imagine the world, any world we want, if we could say every student is going to see, let's say, three of their peers' submissions, and we're going to make it anonymous so they don't know who they're, and this is very important because of all the social pressures in the classroom. If you've passed, you know, uh, evaluate the person to your light left. Well, that's fine, but then when you've got to pass that paper back and look them in the eye, right? And so you want to be nice, you want to be friendly, there's all these social things going on. As soon as you make it anonymous, people aren't friendly anymore. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say they're not friendly, but they're direct. They tend to be very direct and honest in their, in their feedback. Um, and so if you have students doing this with multiple peers, you can accomplish a couple of things at once. First of all, if you ask them to assess it, they have to think about each one. And they have to think about the relative merits. Why is one better than the other? So they're engaging critical thought in a very structured way. And if you further ask them to give each peer some feedback about how their work can be better, especially if you tell them that feedback is part of this, so your feedback will be graded. We want you to give good feedback. Um, now they have to communicate that idea very well. So they're doing receptive communication, listening to what the peer said, critically analyzing it, and then creatively and expressively trying to give some feedback back. So there's a strong evidence that suggests if you want to increase critical thought, this process exercises the parts of the brain that we use to do that. It's a very good exercise. So we love that. OK, two more quick. <laughs> the self-assessment, by the way, right after they assess their peers, ask them to assess their own work. We all are not good at assessing our own work. Um, and I will argue uh, in a moment in this, in this last piece that there are times our education system works against us uh, in some regards. So as far as self-assessment, and even I'll talk about formative assessment, the common practice is you get back something with feedback that says, you didn't do so well. Here are things you could do better going forward. And the evidence suggests that when students read that, they just look to see if there's anything they can argue with you about. Which, by the way, if they come in and want to argue, you've got a great teachable moment right there. <laughs> they care. So that's great. But what we would really like them to be doing is mining feedback to figure out how I can improve myself. That's the real goal. So if you ask them first to explicitly assess their own work, which they don't tend to do all that well, but then you give them this feedback from their peers, and you give them a chance to improve. So you don't just say, this is what your peers thought. It's that here's some suggestions your peers have to improve your work. Go ahead and give it a shot. We'll mark you on this proved one. Now, if they can read the feedback well, think about it well, analyze it well, and use the good bits and ignore the bad bits, they can improve their work and get a better mark. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests when students are allowed to use feedback in that active way, they digest it in a completely different and, and the way we want. Okay. So we've read the literature. 
this stuff um, becomes prominent and, and now is when we start thinking about technology and constraints. So in the ultimate world, we'd love to have all of this. Is there any way we can package all this pedagogy in something we can use in an easy way in the classroom? I'm not a fan of this, um, man, I've just lost the term. <laughs> this term that says you have to blow up the system. What's the disruptive technologies? Um, I, I get what they mean by disruptive technologies, but I think what we really want are technologies that we can use without having to rethink everything we do as much as possible. So um, there's a technology called Peer Scholar. I only throw this up because if you're at all interested after this, you can play with it at this, at this site. You can um, use it with up to 10 students, which might be some of your classes uh, <laughs> freely, anytime, anywhere. Um, let me tell you how it works, just as an instantiation of this logic. Step one, pretty simple. We just ask students to submit what you're probably already asking them to submit, perhaps. Uh, I, like, I like things like argument pieces because they really push critical thinking or analyze what some science process has done, what would you do next to encourage creative thinking or something like that. So you can pick uh, a topic that, that focuses on one of these, but almost anything you ask them to do, as long as they have to go out into the literature, digest some information, summarize it and present it back to you in some form, you are exercising um, a lot of skills. And this is what we've all done with sort of essays through, through a long period of time. But now we can ratchet it up. We can ratchet it up in a, in a couple of ways. First of all, you could have students submit anything. So you can allow them to submit videos or audio files or something, which sometimes for engagement is really helpful. They might like doing something. Create a music video that um, illustrates this one concept that you've learned about in this course. Well, now you got creativity going, but you also got sort of fun and, and that kind of stuff. Enough. Next step. They submitted something. They log into the system, and what we're now saying is, here's three of your peers' submissions. This is what technology is good for. If you think about just stripping the names off, passing these things out to other students, bringing them back together you know, afterwards, the technology just does boring logistics. It's the learning here. And so what we have is a very clear assessment that the instructor can make. Um, a very common one, by the way, is just give it some sort of grade. Give it a, uh, and, and in, in Canada we call this the wish and the hug. It's used a lot in K-12. So the hug is highlight something this person is doing well um, to reinforce that. You should continue to do that. This is really good. But the wish is that thing. Okay, if there's one thing you could change, and this is how I typically word it, if there's one thing this person could change that you think would maximally improve their grade, what is that one thing? And give them some idea about how to go about changing it. Okay, that's the, the real sort of gem. And, and again, keep in mind, in order to do that for each one of these, you have to really critically think about it. What, what would make it better? And so we're getting them in this mindset of doing that, and now they do it over and over and over. In my course, it's six peers that they assess. So think about my course for a second, by the way. 1,800 students. But now we have this group of six who are assessing and giving each other feedback on each other's work, learning from the feedback the other person gives. It's almost a Socratic kind of situation happening in an 1800 student course. Um, and so that was the kind of goal. Students are engaging in all of these skills with every step along the way and something even more important is happening. It's one thing to have a teacher tell you your work is C quality. It's something else entirely for you to see the work of your peers and think, my work is C quality. Um, it's, it's palpable, it comes from within, right? And that's very powerful. Not only do you see that, but when you're seeing the A quality, you're seeing an example, you know, very clear idea of what you could be doing differently, what you could be doing better. So it's a very rich learning signal that's going on here. Um, and so we ask them to do this, and then we have a self-assessment step at the end to get that metacognitive. Okay, now you're in this analytical mindset looking at your peers' work, now look again at your own. What do you think um, of that? And then just third step, just to give you a sense, they've been doing this to three peers. Three peers have been doing the same thing to their work. So in the third step, they now see their work, and they see the feedback that each peer gave them. And they are told, that, here's another funny thing about our education system. When students get feedback from us, for the most part, I mean, they may argue. Some students will try to argue something to get a better mark. But for the most part, they accept. 
you know, this person says this was wrong with my piece. It was wrong. One of the things I love about peer feedback is it's noisy. I can tell my students some of your peers are going to give you really useful advice. Some of your peers, their advice will be not useful at all. And by the way, that's life. <laughs> that's the way life works. Um, you will get feedback all through life and you have to evaluate the feedback, decide for yourself whether you think you believe it or not, whether doing what this person says will improve your work. Um, and so again, we're engaging all that critical thought, we're engaging the metacognitive thought um, as they go through. And again, th this could be from three different peers now, where they're going through and we get that re repetition going on. Keep in mind, everything I just talked about in the last two steps, no instructors were involved. Okay, and there's all this pedagogy, all this learning going on, and they're all driving it themselves. Now you do want, an instructor at the end in the optimal situation to grade the final piece and to grade the quality of the feedback. That kind of keeps them engaged in the process as they go all through. Um, but other than that, there's a whole lot of rich stuff that's happening all on their own. Okay, so this is again something I just present as, as an example I think we can apply to a lot of these things. The, the information versus skills was a particular challenge in my area and I think it is a challenge that many of us share. Um, but that notion of starting with the data, figuring out what would work, coming up with your dream situation, and then worrying about the logistics of making it happen, um, either via technology or via something else, uh, is, is the kind of approach I want to suggest today. So, did I rent, did I just like rip through that? Or I, <laughs> I don't know. This will give us more time for questions uh, at the end if I, if I went too fast. But uh, thank you very much. I hope that was cool.